All right, good morning, Greenville Oaks. Welcome, everyone. I invite you to come on in and find a seat as it is time for us to begin this morning. If you're joining us online, we're so thankful uh, that you have chosen to click in and uh, be with us today. And as always, I hope this is a time of encouragement to you as we worship and honor our Lord and Savior together this morning. It is a joy to be here with you this morning. It's a joy to share in this time of worship, and I invite you to stand as we enter into a time of praise. Let's sing together, The King. Raise a victory banner, for the war is won. Come and celebrate what the Lord has done. For the joy before Him, He endured the cross. He was thinking of every one of us. All glory to Jesus, all praise to His holy name, all honor for heaven to the Lamb, the Christ, the King. Thank you. 
by His grace and crown Him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to Him all majesty ascribe and crown. feet may fall, we'll join the everlasting praise song him and praise him, Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and praise him, Lord. Be seated. Good morning and welcome to Greenville Oaks. If this is your first Sunday with us, we're especially glad that you are here. We're a church seeking to inspire people to follow Jesus each and every day. There's lots of exciting things happening around Greenville Oaks and we want to make sure that you don't miss out on any of it. If you're a guest with us, come see me at the welcome area. One of our values is combating isolation. We invite you to do that with friends over a cup of coffee in our coffee bar. And once you've got your coffee, feel free to hang out and enjoy the Maloney family room. Parents and children, be sure to stop by the Geo Kids check-in area to check in for worship and gathering circles. You can also now check in using the Geo app on your phone. We love our kids at Greenville Oaks, and our nursery is open the entire morning for babies and toddlers. And just a little bit later on in our worship services, we'll be partaking of a communion service. And we invite you all to make sure you go to one of the tables around the worship center and pick up the communion elements. And don't forget to click on the QR code in the seat back in front of you. That QR code will take you to all the different things that are happening in and around the Greenville Oaks Church of Christ. Again, we really are glad that you're here and that you've come to worship with us this morning. What Miguel doesn't know and what most people don't realize is when Miguel left my office, I shut my door and I cried. Es que cuando Miguel se fue de mi oficina, yo cerré mi puerta y me puse a llorar. I cried because I had been praying that God would bring an opportunity for us to partner to better serve the Latino community that lives around us here in Allen and Collin County. Yo está, estaba llorando. Good morning, Greenville Oaks. I hope you weren't distracted by the legs and those shorts. <laughs> wow. That was two years ago. We all have made bad choices in the past and <laughs> repent. I want to share with you something that I'm very, very excited about, and that is the continued progression of the opportunity that we have been talking about for months and months and months, and that is that the Renova Iglesia Church is going to become a part of Greenville Oaks. Yeah, absolutely, you do that. Yeah, you do that. And you're clapping for God because God's the one who's been working and doing something that I can't fully explain. And, um, but I'm excited about what's happening. And um, next uh, Saturday, June the 29th, is going to be the start of what I hope will be many, many, many years of us working together 
as I said two years ago, that clip was from a worship service we did with them two years ago. Serving, loving, blessing, making a difference in our community, and specifically having an opportunity to better minister to and serve the Latino community um, through this new partnership. But I want you all to come Sunday or Saturday night, the 29th. And I want you to come, and I want you to come not just to have a great time of worship. It'll be a bilingual worship experience. We'll have Spanish, we'll have English, we'll have both happening at the same time. It'll be a beautiful worship experience. But I want you to come because I want you to be, uh, come be a part of what will be the beginning of something truly amazing that God is doing in this church, the growth and the opportunity for us to better serve our community, and again, specifically the Latino community. So clear out your calendar, make plans to be here in this room, 7 p.m. this coming Saturday night, June the 29th, worship with us. Uh, the, the Renova Church will be here as well. I asked Miguel this week uh, if, if people were, from his church were going to be coming, and his response was, they're all going to be there. They're excited. They're excited to be here, and I hope that we will show up too. And like I said, this is the beginning of something incredibly special. You're going to hear more details uh, over the next month or so as we move forward with this, but I am excited that God is continuing to lead us and guide us in this incredible opportunity. So kick it off by being a part of Night of Worship on Saturday, June the 29th, 7 p.m. Come worship with us and the Renova Church. Okay, I also wanna make sure you are aware of several other things that are going on. First of all, DGO is happening today, Discover Greenville Oaks. So if you're a guest, new member, uh, maybe this is your first Sunday here and you're just curious about who Greenville Oaks is, we'd love to invite you to go be a part of a special class that we offer periodically, and it happens to be this morning in uh, room 176, which is right out these doors here. And uh, one of our elders and one of our staff will be there, and uh, several of us will stop in to say hi and, and welcome you. And you get a chance to just ask questions, learn who we are as a community of faith. And uh, we invite you to be a part of that. Whether you're just curious or you're ready to place membership, it does not matter. Any and all are welcome to come be a part of DGO. Again, right after this worship service, during our gathering circle time, and on into our second service. All right, I also wanna share with you something that the student ministry has going on, and that is they are doing a little fundraiser, and it's gonna be happening next Sunday, June 30th, and you can get your car washed. Now, I think these car washes are like $75 a piece because they're trying to raise money, so I'm not telling you it's a good deal. I'm telling you it's going to a really good cause, and that's what really matters. I can't even guarantee the quality of the car wash, but again, it's gonna be a great, great time. Um, it starts at 10.30. It'll go through um, in the, the second service on into the afternoon a little bit, but the kids are actually trying to raise $2,000 for their back-to-school retreat. They're doing something a little bit bigger and special than they've done in the past, and uh, it's a little bit outside of the framework of our current general fund budget plan. And so Zach said, we want to take on the opportunity for our kids to earn some extra money to help pay for the expenses of this great back-to-school retreat that'll be happening the end of July. So make plans to uh, swing by. They're going to be set up in the parking lot, uh, ready to wash some cars and take some donations and just make a little extra money for their student ministry next Sunday, June 30th. All right, also want to now share with you something uh, very special this morning. We've got a guest speaker that's going to be uh, preaching for us. Jonathan Stormont is here, and uh, Wade's out for the next couple weeks on vacation and, um, and doing some study time away, and, and he'll be back in a little bit. But in the meantime, there's some people that are going to be filling in for him, and Jonathan is the first one up, and his wife Leslie is here as well. We're glad that you guys have uh, decided to be with us this morning. And let me share with you, Jonathan is, uh, is the preacher at the, uh, the Pleasant Valley Church of Christ in Arkansas. Uh, and this is just a few little thoughts that he has shared that I can share with you. Um, a little bio. My family and I love reading, traveling, daddy-daughter dates, playing outdoors on our family land, good music, long meals with friends. Uh, he and his wife, Leslie, met in 2001, were married in 2003, have five children, correct? Five children, um, definitely busy. Definitely very busy. And um, this is what I love. I want you to hear these words. I think this shares the heart of who Jonathan is as he brings the word in just a little bit. I believe that the local church is the hope of the world, and I am passionate about discipling people in the way of Jesus. And so we're excited that Jonathan will bring in our message in just a little bit. Thank you again for being here and look forward to hearing what God has to share through you, Jonathan. And one final thing I'm very excited to share with you at second service, we've got a, a baptism that's gonna be happening. 
uh, Lucas Rose is, uh, is going to be giving his life to Christ and being baptized at second service. Yeah, absolutely. And we just want to celebrate that. Um, this is our 30th baptism over the, uh, the last year, and so we just continue to give thanks that God is giving us opportunity to grow people's faith and be a part of the journey of faith. Uh, so many people celebrating transformation is one of our values, and truly we are getting a chance to do that. And so uh, feel free to stick around if you want for the beginning of second service. It'll be happening there and be a part of celebrating with Lucas and his family later, later on this morning. All right, I'm going to invite you to stand if you don't mind, and I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then we'll continue on in our worship this morning. Father God, thank you for being our creator, for being magnificent and awesome. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for knowing every hair on our head. Thank you for the hope and the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. And Father, this morning, we simply just give back to you what you have given us, and that is every ounce of our love Father, may your name be blessed and be glorified in all that you are. We love you, and we are grateful most of all for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it is because of him that we worship and we celebrate today. Amen. Let's continue worshiping this morning. On the altar of our praise, let there be no other name. Jesus, Son of God, you laid down your perfect life. You are the sacrifice. Jesus, Son of God, on the altar of our praise, let there be no other name. Jesus, Son of God. Pray. 
Please be seated. There is so much that demands our attention in life. Maybe you experienced some of those things as you were driving here today. Maybe it's the demands of family. Maybe it's chasing after kids. Maybe it's chasing after success. Maybe it's the next new thing. Maybe it's the next shiny thing. Maybe it is the next service project that I can jump into, and then the next service project that I can jump into, and then the next good thing, that I, and the next good thing. that, I, And in all of that, we lose sight of what's most important. And that's what this table is about this morning, is drawing us to a place, letting all of the things of life fade away, and that the cross of Jesus and the sacrifice of made there is at the center of what we do this morning. So I invite you, I implore you, that as we gather around this table and as we take this bread and as we drink this cup, let's focus on what is most important. Let's survey the cross this morning. Let's don't give it just a token glance or, oh, yes, this is the time we do this and we just move on. No, pause for a second. I'm going to give you a little time to do that this morning. So hopefully you've, you've picked up your cup. If you haven't, it's around the room. And let's spend some time together at the cross. Holy Father, we come to you this morning, and Father, I want to lay down all the busyness of life, all the things that we chase after, all the things that demand our attention, lay them at the foot of the cross, and Father, we just want to spend some time with you. recognizing what you have done for us through your son, Jesus. Giving that the attention it deserves. So, Father, as we take this cup and as we take the bread, let those things melt away. And may we spend time with you and only you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
in Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what nights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of christ i stand in christ alone who took on flesh fullness of god in helpless babe this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost his grip on me for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. Amen. My friends, from three years old to fifth grade, you guys can be dismissed to children's worship. We've got Miss Jen and several of our children's ministry volunteers back here to help you guys get checked in. If you're a guest with us today, you'd like for your kiddos to be a part or your kiddos would like to be a part of children's worship, just tell them to follow the uh, crowd down the, uh, out the door and then down the hall here, and we'll have wonderful volunteers that will help get you checked in. All right. Let's stand. Let's sing one more song here before Jonathan brings us his message this morning. All to us. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe you're all to us. Let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. Righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe your all to us, only Son of God sent from heaven. Hope and mercy at the cross. of the church. Let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe your all to us. Let's sing that again. Let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. Righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe your all 
good to be with y'all this morning. Uh, I am so pumped that Wade Hodges is your preacher. I love that dude. I remember the first time I heard him at the Tulsa workshop just being like, who is this guy? He's so gifted and he's also a better person and friend. He's one of my best preacher friends and I am pumped that he's here and he and Heather love it here. And he tells me that in rooms where he doesn't have to say that. So it's true. And I also want to give a shout out to one of my heroes. And I mean this sincerely. He's standing in the back, Brother Ron Anders. A lot of y'all don't know this. My wife, had her, her dad had terminal cancer last year. And we called Wade. And Wade called Ron. And Ron and my father-in-law have become really good friends because of Ron's consistent ministry to someone who matters a lot to me. So Brother Ron, yeah, can we give it up for Brother Ron? <clears throat> yes or no? I think they are the two most powerful words in the English language because they are direction-setting words. They are words that open up new possibilities or close them down. And every yes is a no to something else. And every no makes... Uh, another yes possible. I was trying to think through the biggest yes or no moments in my life, and I realized it was when 21 years ago, Leslie and I are in Germany. We we're free traveling after studying in Greece, and I had a ring in my pocket. I'd had it for a few months. I'd saved up for a couple of, like a year to get it. I have the ring in my pocket, and we're walking along the streets of Nuremberg, Germany. I'm about to propose, and I kid you not, she breaks up with me. And it's not the kind of breakup like, maybe we'll see how it works out. It's the kind of breakup like, the restraining order will expire eventually, Jonathan. Uh, I hadn't been a great boyfriend. She had caught me in a couple of white lies trying to plan this surprise. And she didn't want to marry or be with a liar. And I, so I'm walking along the streets of Nuremberg, Germany, and I'm like devastated. Like, what do I do? And then in the back of my mind, I'm like, should I just propose anyway? <laughs> and so I get down on my knees to this woman who had just said, we're done forever. And I say, speaking of forever. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see the, the wheels in her mind turning like maybe he doesn't get how relationships work. <laughs> and it feels like an eternity before she finally says the answer that would lead us to the life we have today. Do you know the average person 70 times a day says, makes a choice? 70 times a day you decide to do this and not that, to go here and not there, and those choices add up. That's 500 times a week, that, and that's 20,000 a year. There's a philosopher named Albert Camus who says basically who we are is the sum of our choices, and I think all of us get that. And the Bible has a profound word to use to be the kind of person who can say yes to the right things and no to the wrong things. It's to become a kind of person, and the word for that is wisdom. There's a whole section in the Bible called the wisdom tradition, and it's trying to help us become the kind of people who know when to say yes and when to say no, which is important. I know it's important to you because in my 21 years of ministry, the number one question I get is, what is God's will for my life? 
which is a really big question. Should I marry that person? Should I go to grad school? Should I move back home to be close to family? So in the Bible, the Proverbs is a manual. It's basically, it's written like a parent sitting down with a child, teaching them how to say yes, when to say yes, when to say no. It's given them all these examples of kind of fortune cookie choice wisdom. And Proverbs is attributed to Solomon. Now, do you remember the story of Solomon? Solomon, he becomes king at an early age. He has a dream. It's a genie in the bottle, closest to a genie in the bottle story we have in the Bible, where God comes to him in a dream and says, whatever you want. And he asks for wisdom. And then the very next story is this chilling story of these two women who had two babies, and one of them died. And the woman whose baby died, she steals the other baby, and there's this argument, she said, she said, and it escalates all the way to this newly minted King Solomon. And in this moment where no one knows what to do, Solomon says, separate the baby and give one half to each. It's a horrible story, except it's profound and brilliant and wise, because this is an example of wisdom. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Some of y'all have seen this picture or you've heard of this ethical dilemma. It's called, it's a parable. Warm and filled, yeah, okay, got it. All right, so the ethical dilemma of the trolley goes like this. You see that person at the railroad crossing? A trolley is coming, a train is coming, and it's gonna hit five people. Or you can pull that lever and it'll switch to the other track, but it's gonna hit one person. So how many of you would pull the lever and save the five, kill the one? Just show of hands. Okay, it's really uncomfortable, I get it. Yeah, uh, so the person right there in the blue shirt, yeah, you, uh, why would you pull the lever? Less people die, but you're killing one. Okay, yeah, I know, you're like, well, I guess I'm kind of a murderer, but I'm also a hero. It's complicated. Yeah, it's a parable of utilitarian ethics. Uh, it's taught all around universities all over the world, and it's really uncomfortable because, but this is life. What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when there's not a right or wrong, right? And that's the thing about wisdom. And it's different than the way we normally think because we normally think through terms of right and wrong. But so much of life isn't right or wrong. It's is it wise or foolish to do it? What are you gonna do in the situation that you're in? Every one of us, if you've lived long enough, have been in situations where we're out, out of our depth. We don't know what to do, um, you know, and. And stuff like, should I, you know, marry them, settle down, or serve God with my singleness? And every yes is a no to something else. And every no leaves an open for another yes. And that's the difference between wisdom and right or wrong. Because what I've seen a ton of times is we can justify it and we ignore the maybe dozen other people in our life who's telling us, yeah, it's not wrong for you to date him. But you have taken a step, certainly, in a direction that is, you know, you are aligning yourself with that person emotionally, spiritually, relationally. There's a time in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus is being attacked by religious leaders, and um, Jesus says to them, listen, wisdom is proved right by her children, which is genius, because everyone knows the one thing children do is grow up. And eventually, what happens in the home becomes public. Wisdom is proved right by her children. In other words, time will tell. So what do you do? How do you know if something's wise? Do you just have to wait 10 years and see? Well, yes and no. Because there is another way, and it is the way of wisdom. There is a word in uh, Greek philosophy and in the Christian tradition. It's a big word. It's called telos. It means ultimate aim or object. It is, in other words, what your life is ultimately aimed at. And we get from that word telos the word 
for telescope. And the way this works is in the vast, infinite possibilities of the universe, you point at one thing, and you can zoom in and look way ahead. A telos. In other words, and this is a universal truth, you will get, for the most part, what your life is aiming at. In the book of Proverbs, there is a huge metaphor. It's path or direction. And over and over again, the father is sitting down with the son, warning him, everybody's on a path somewhere. And if you're not attending to what your path is, you're gonna wind up in a, in a place you never meant to be. And you have seen this over and over again in your own life and other people's lives. And that's what I love about the book of Proverbs. It's all these examples of when to say yes and when to say no and noticing what kind of path you're on. So here's some examples of some Proverbs that I just find lovely. In Proverbs 27, 14. If anyone loudly blesses their neighbor in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. I love this so much because what the dad is saying to the son is, look, son, there are two kinds of people in this world. There are morning people and there are people who hate morning people. That's the kinds of people there are. Or what about this one? Uh, Go to the next slide. Better to live on the corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Now, you can swip the genders, but what he's saying to his son, what a mom is saying to her daughter, it's better to wake up every day and be alone than to wake up and wish you were. Or what about this one? Proverbs 13, the ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man hears no threat. In other words, if you're rich, if somebody kidnaps your kid, you can pay the ransom. But if you're not rich, nobody's trying to kidnap your kid. In other words, and this is all very profound, money does not give you the security you think it does. It instead invites a whole nother set of insecurities and anxieties. And what I love about this kind of stuff is this isn't in the Ten Commandments or in Jeremiah. It's in the Proverbs and the wisdom tradition books that we find God cares about our actual lives as we're living them. Our Tuesdays and our, you know, like Memorial Day weekends. And I think it shows we need God's help down at the level we actually live life. What kind of person should I marry? Should I get married? What kind of job should I have? What kind of calling should I have? How can I endure suffering when I can't escape it? And ultimately, what kind of man or woman do I want to become? And in order to become the kind of person you want to do, you have to pay attention to the path, the telos, your life is on. When uh, I was uh, a few years ago, my, my family and I, we go to Gulf Shores every, uh, every summer, and we lived in Abilene at the time. We have five kids, and so we drive late, because that's what you do. And I am driving to Abilene. We've been driving for, I don't know, 12, 13 hours. I'm driving from Abilene, 12, 13 hours. Uh, GPS, it's like one or two in the morning. Everybody's asleep except me. I'm 30 minutes away from the home home where we're going to see the rest of my family. And it's like two in the morning and the GPS says, now board ferry. I was like, what? There's no ferry running at 2 a.m. And so now we had to drive an additional two and a half hours all the way around to get to the peninsula. And I was so mad. I was like, is this America or not? Can we not build a bridge? The problem was I didn't have anybody to be mad at but myself because I wasn't attending to the path I was on. I wasn't looking ahead. It was my fault. I only had one person to be mad at, and I didn't like who that was. So in the book of Proverbs, there's three characters, and I hope this is helpful to help you learn how to read wisdom tradition. So it's a parent sitting down with a child, and he's saying, look, there's three characters. One is the simple These are people, it's not a judgment, it's just saying they haven't lived enough life. They don't know what's good and bad. They don't know what's wise and foolish. Then the second character is the fool. These are people who don't care what's coming. They're going to enjoy whatever they want right now. And then there's the wise person, person who knows when to say yes and when to say no. 
And the profound thing about wisdom, and this plays out over and over again in pastoral ministry, in my mirror, is that the solution for the simple is time. But the solution for the full is tragedy. Yeah, they know it says that on the box, the Surgeon General, but they're going to smoke them anyway. And eventually, everyone gets where we're going. In the words of the Bible, we all reap what we sow. And, you know, we're, we all believe in grace here, right? We believe the grace of God, it, it covers everything. The problem is we're using that word categorically wrong. So, for example, if you eat a giant cheesecake in one sitting and you tell me, Grace is going to cover this. It's like, okay. Your, grace isn't going to be reflected in your scales tomorrow morning, though, right? If you vape or abuse drugs, God's grace can cover you, but you will definitely be taking a step towards the consequences of addiction. You will reap what you sow, and that can be a really good thing. There is a time in the story of Israel when Solomon, in all his wisdom, leads Israel to flourish, so much so that the queen of another country, the queen of Sheba, comes to see just what it is. And in 1 Kings chapter 10, I'm just gonna summarize this for you. She's blown away by what wise leadership does to a community. And by the way, this has always been God's heart for the church, that we would be a city on a hill, that the way we lived together would show a counterculture for the good of culture. And Queen of Sheba is blown away. There is a time in Jesus's ministry where he is, uh, he brings up this story. And he actually says to religious people who aren't very good at listening to him, in the last days, he refers to this story, the Queen of Sheba will rise up and judge you. Because there is one greater than Solomon. How do you be greater than Solomon? He's the wisest person who ever lived. Well, it turns out it's actually not that hard. Because wisdom is super easy to see in other people's lives. But it's really hard to actually do. So in the very next chapter, here is the summary of the life of Solomon. In 1 Kings chapter 11, if you could put that up. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites. They were from nations about which the Lord said, not because of ethnicity, but because of pagan gods. You must not intermarry with them because, watch that, they will turn that's direction language, your heart after other gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. If you go to the next slide, he had 700 wives. Solomon grew old, and watch this. They turned his heart after other gods. They turned his heart. I don't know why God made the world the way it is. I don't know why it is the way it is, why there's cancer and death and so much sorrow. But I do know the Christian tradition is saying that on some level, it is the way it is because on some level, we chose it. Adam and Eve chose it. And every other person since. And it's hard to be easy, hard on Solomon. It's easy to be hard on Solomon. It's easy to be hard on Adam and Eve. But what is human history but one long commentary of us saying the same thing. Did God really say? Can God really be trusted? But God, she's so beautiful. But God, he's so great. But God, the money's right there for the taking and no one will ever know. What is the life of Solomon but one more parable of the same old thing? God gives Solomon everything he could want and even then it's not enough. St. Augustine in his book Confessions says the worst thing he's ever done, and he's done a lot of bad stuff. Like he, he, he's very, uh, he was very promiscuous. He had written very honestly about it. But he says the worst thing I ever did was when I was a kid, me and my friends stole from a neighbor's pear tree. And if you're reading Confessions, you're like, that's not the worst thing you've ever done. So, but he says it's the worst thing I ever did because I had my own pear tree. And I wasn't even hungry. 
I just stole because I wanted, I knew it was wrong and I wanted to do it. You can call that whatever you want, total depravity, original sin. I think a great word for it is foolishness. And in the words of the Bible, we always reap what we sow. And this is why it's so important to pay attention to your direction, to what you say yes to and what you say no to. But despite your choices, God has not abandoned us. When I was writing the sermon, I talked to Randy Harris, one of my best friends in Abilene, and he said, you know what the problem is with, that's my Randy Harris, uh, you know what the problem is with Proverbs? And I was like, I don't know, Job's friends, like, you know, if your life's going bad, it's your fault. He said, that's the number two problem. The number one problem in Proverbs is it's godless. And I was like, I don't know, Randy, I, I see God all over it. But here's, the, here's what he was saying. If read outside by itself, Proverbs can come into some kind of karma, right? Whatever you put out in the universe, you just get back, which, you know, is sometimes true and sometimes not. But it, the book of Proverbs must be read through the lens of the gospel. I think of the story of the prodigal son, this fool who does every single thing the dad in the Proverbs warns his son not to do. He uses money, he squanders money, he goes and sleeps with prostitutes, he blows it all, he hits rock bottom, and then he turns directions. And as soon as he does, the father comes running. And he can't cover over the consequences. That money's been spent. Those memories can't be unmade. But in the kingdom of God, Money's never been that important anyway. And new memories can always be made. And the way I read Proverbs is through the lens of that story. And it's only in the Gospel of Luke that we find out that Jesus is the Father hunting for prodigals. And in the end, he found one. We don't know much about him. It's only in Luke that we hear about him, but this guy, he was poor, he grew up in Israel at a time of great oppression by Rome, and every day he made 70 decisions. Every day he said yes to this and no to that, and one day at a time, his trajectory led him, until finally he was tired of scraping by to feed his wife and kids. He was tired of Rome's taxes, and he decided somebody's got to do something. And so he decided to rebel. He was actually part of an insurrection. And when Rome caught him, Rome did what they did so well. They stripped him naked, they stretched out his arms, and they nailed him to a cross. And this thief this insurrectionist on the cross, on that day, noticed he was crucified next to a very popular rabbi. He knew it was him because over his head was the sign, the king of the Jews. And this thief on the cross, who got where he got 70 decisions a day, 500 decisions a week, 20,000 a year. This thief on the cross who had come by where he was honestly found himself with one last decision to make. <laughs> and it turns out it was enough. Look, I don't know how the, how the kingdom of God works. This blows my mind that God gives his very best to the very worst blows my mind. But the best I can do to explain it is that in the economy of heaven, grace trumps even wisdom. I am looking at people and some of you, you've made a dumpster fire of your life. Maybe it's private, maybe it's not. 
Some of you, you can avoid this. You don't have to go through this, but never forget this is the heart of God, that in the economy of God, no matter what kind of mess we have made of our life, grace trumps even wisdom. Not the consequences, but the ends. Because Jesus is greater than Solomon. Have you ever wondered why on his head as he died, his crown is made of what? Where's the first time you hear thorns in the Bible? Adam and Eve. His crown is our consequences. Our curse is his crown. He wears a crown of thorns because Jesus is the shining that your shame cannot extinguish. He is the door where you thought there was only wall. He is what comes after deserving. And while he may be like a king, kings are not like him. He is greater than Solomon. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessing that this church is. I thank you um, for these scriptures. I pray that you would help make us the kind of men and women who can become wise and lean into your grace. That we would not become like the older brother in that prodigal son story who considers ourselves slaving because we do the wise or right thing, but who can realize this whole thing is only grace. And therefore, we want to reap what we sow in a very good way. We want our lives to bear good fruit. And when we fail, God, may we run back to your arms and may your grace cover our foolishness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you so much for reminding us that grace trumps all. All right, let's stand together. Let's uh, sing a chorus of this song and then we'll be dismissed. Let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. Let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe your Let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe yours to us. When this passing world is over, we will see. day.